I'm Dr. Gail Gross. My guest today is a renowned spiritual leader, author, and editor of over 30 books on spirituality and mysticism. Andrew Harvey was born in India and lived there until he was nine years old, a period in his life that he credits with shaping his vision of the inner unity of all religions. While studying at Oxford, he became the youngest person ever to be awarded the Fellow of All Souls College, England's highest academic honor. Since 1977, he lived in London, Paris, New York, San Francisco, and Las Vegas, where he has devoted time to studying a variety of all religions, including Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity. His book, Mary's Vineyard, Daily Readings, Meditations, and Revelations, earned him the Benjamin Franklin Award and the Mind Body Spirit Award. He also co authored the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, and more recently, The Direct Path. He was the subject of a BBC documentary in 1993 called The Making of a Mystic, and today devotes his studies and writings to explaining the direct path to God. Andrew Harvey, welcome to the program. Hmm. It is an honor for me to have you here, a privilege. You are truly one of the greatest leaders of our time in the world of spirituality, a time when it's so needed. Tell us how your journey began. What is your story? I was born in India, and I think that's the key to my story. Because being born in India is being born in a naturally sacred world in which all things are revered as sacred. I was born of British parents in India, and I think being born in India gives you three main perceptions. First of all, that God includes horror and terror and suffering as well as light and glory and peace. Secondly, that the entire world, everything in the world, is blessed and holy, from the tiniest flea to the most extraordinary and brilliant elephant. And I think that the other perception that it gave me was that all religions are different facets of a one overwhelming truth. Because I had a Hindu cook, a Muslim driver, a Catholic nanny and Protestant parents. And very early on in my life, I intuited that in essence, all the religions were trying to lead people to the same place of revelation. Yes, you know, I was a very close friend of Swami Satchidananda. Yes. And he always said, paths are many and truth is one. And therefore, he honored and valued all religions in their purest form as bringing the truth to everyone, peace, compassion, and love. This is one of the great achievements of Hinduism. And in saying that, he's really saying the deepest truth about his own religion. Yes. One of the visions of Hinduism, which I love, and this goes to the core of what I learned as a child, yes. is something that Ramakrishna said. He said that, yes. think of God as a mother and think of Revelation as a big white fish, and think of the human family as six or seven extremely demanding, quarrelsome children of, of the mother, and think of the mother then saying, well, what I've got to do is to cook the white fish in different ways for my different children. Yeah. My mentor, and the man who changed my life, and I'm sure we'll be talking about him, Father Bede Griffiths, used to hold up his hand like this, and he used to say, Think this is Christianity, this is Taoism, this is Buddhism, this is Hinduism, these are all the native religions. And they seem very different, don't they, on the hand. And they are, because there are different dogmas, there are different ways of formulating the absolute. But when you come to the center of the hand, I love this. you have the inmost experience that all the mystics of all the traditions are looking for. And that experience is an experience of non-dual identity with the entire cosmos. And that experience is the truth of all sentient beings, of all human beings, and it is to have that experience of non-dual identity, of deep, deep, rapturous, blissful, conscious unity with all existence. Yes. And the deep truths of all of the mystical traditions 
enshrine that experience and help us get to it. And one of the most glorious things about being alive now is that if you really want this experience, if you really want to know who you truly are, what the universe really is, and your relationship to the universe, you have before you an extraordinary array of mystical practices from all of the different traditions that you can use in your own way to come to this realization and live from it. This is a terrifying time and a wonderful time. In Buddhism, we always talk about the Sutra Path, which is the oral tradition of Buddha. And of course, there are many Buddhas. We, we think of there as being one teacher. And yet, what the interest is, what we're really told is, that divine is in all of us. There is God in yes. the godliness in all of us, the soul in Your all Christ of us. Your Christ nature is as good as Christ's Christ nature. And, Your and Buddha he said nature. to his apo apostles, of course, go out and heal as I've healed. It's there for all of us. Yes. We all have that potential. Tell me your vision of the rebirth of the feminine, the end of the warrior, and some kind of marriage or integration yes. of, of really a hopeful total individuated world as well as individuated individual well my deepest belief and it's actually been my inmost experience is that we are now as a human race entering what I hope will be the era of the sacred marriage yes. in which the integration between the two sides of God what you could call the masculine and the feminine sides of God will take place in the human on every level and so what will happen is an integration of a vision of heaven with a vision of a renovated and transformed earth the deepest truths of the feminine with the deepest truths of the masculine the holiness of the body with the holiness of the soul and a deep mystical practice with radical action to create a wholly new way of acting in the world which I call mystical activism. And you see the world right now in an apocalyptic moment. The world is in the apocalypse, but the apocalypse is not what everybody believes it to be, a terminal situation. It is actually... A force it, for change. It's a birth process. Yes. And in the mystical process, which I partly been through, you go through what is called a dark night of the soul in uh -huh. which you lose all your moorings and you're stripped of all of your certainties and all your illusions are shattered and you suffer horribly. But if you know what's happening, you know that this suffering is not the end. It is actually the preparation for a wholly new level of consciousness. The world is now going through a communal dark night of the soul, what I call the dark night of the species. Yes. It is that I believe the divine is a presenting a mirror to humanity when it gets humanity's attention and I think humanity yes. is now listening because yes. terrible crisis makes you listen mm. the divine turns the mirror to the right and the mirror goes dark and a seven-headed beast of the apocalypse appears in it which we all have to look at and very simply those seven heads are the following a terrible busyness an appalling hectic busyness and anxiety which prevent people from really getting to the core of their divine knowledge and their divine nature. And if you combine that, a population explosion with a environmental holocaust, with fundamentalism, with weapons of mass destruction, with addiction to technology, with mass media that trivializes everything, and the, this busyness that prevents self-recognition at the deepest level. No you contemplation. Have no contemplation, no peace of mind. Yes. You have the recipe for what's going on. Right. But once the divine has really forced you to look at that and really got your attention then the divine will smile and the mirror will turn and you'll see what I call the golden mirror which my life has been dedicated to staring into yes. and what I see in the golden mirror are seven stars of the new birth of humanity and of the birth of the sacred marriage on earth and I see in those stars as the following I see those stars the first one is the crisis itself the crisis is a vast opportunity for us to face our shadow as a human race and also to face the divine that lives within us and start calling upon it to yes. renovate everything the second thing I see is that the technology that is very devastating in many ways is also offering all kinds of new possibilities to humanity and <laughs> third the fact that the mass media terrible though it is has, has turned up with we're talking on it and has turned up with the whole marvelous new tool of the internet imagine a world galvanized by the real information on the internet to start setting mystical activism in purpose imagine the fourth star is something that i know you care about deeply and you know i care about deeply which is that now all 
of the revelations of all of the mystical traditions are available to all yes. humanity. They've been translated. And not only the revelations are available, and this is so crucial, but the actual sacred technology, the visualizations, the meditations that before were kept secret, secret are now available to all human yes. beings at a moment of immense crisis to give them the way to experience their divine nature so that they can go out fearlessly and transform the apocalypse into resurrection. Yes. The fifth great facet is that in nonviolence, in the work of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Nelson Mandela and of course His, His Holiness, Holiness the Dalai Lama, yes. we've been given a tool of political action rooted in soul force that really can slowly transform almost impossible situations. Yes. And this brings me to the last two points, which fundamentally are one point, which is that the divine really wants this great change to yes. happen and is showering humanity with knowledge and bliss and grace and revelation Anyone who really wants to wake up now will be helped to find whatever they need, whichever aspect of whatever revelation or religion or tradition they need to wake up. The divine has an agenda. That agenda is the transfiguration of the human race, the birth of the new humanity, the birth of the sacred marriage. And what I would really love to say to you is that the clue, which is why number six, is the return of the divine feminine. Right. And she's coming back in all kinds of ways. She's coming back theologically and mystically, but she's also coming back in holistic medicine, mm -hmm. in visions of cooperation in business, in the great resurgence of feminine rights, in the great resurgence of gay rights. All of these ways show the mother's return, and that leads to the seventh point, which is the fact is that the mother is the force that we're going to be drawing yes. upon to change this whole thing around. And I just want to give you one example. In the worst year of my life, and it was a terrible year, I left my guru because I no longer agreed with her. I blessed her, but I left her. Which was Madame Mira. Madame Mira. And terrible things happened. There were death threats and God knows what. And I've gone past this, but my. it was a bad year. And at one moment, I felt desperate. And we went to worship Mary. That day I bought a card, a Mexican card. I love kitsch and I bought a Mexican card of her with an open shirt and a heart. I put it on my desk, I went out of the room and I came back and the desk was covered with what I thought was water and it wasn't water. It was actually rose perfume that had oh, poured yes, from the heart and that heart smelled for three months. Many people smelled that heart. That rose water was a was divine there. miracle yes. and I turned the card around and what yes. it said is whatever happens I will be with you and I will protect you. And I realized I was getting that message from myself in that time but also that the mother was saying that to the whole of humanity. Yes. Don't get terrified by the darkness. Choose the divine light within you. Know that I am here. Know that the very extent of the darkness is something that I'm allowing to help you wake up and know that I will give you every strength, every truth, every revelation, every passion to help you transform the situation if you really want it. Yes. So and I'm convinced that we've come to this period when we have to choose yes. very deeply and that all of the divine will help us yes. do so. Yes, and we're really just choosing God. Choosing, but we're also choosing with, the God inside in, ourselves. Within. It's not just the, the God outside. The interior truth. We're choosing the truth of the mystical traditions, yes. which have all said to us in different ways, you are a part of God. You were born not with original sin, right. but with original blessing. Right. The divine consciousness is your birthright. Right. All beings are holy. Yes. The world is holy. You're living in a holy place. Yes. Get on with it. Yes. Have the feast. Be just. Feed the poor. Yes. Make beautiful buildings that express the yes. radiance of God. Have hospitals built for people who can't afford it. Live the life of God, which is the life of yes. compassion and the life of justice, and have the feast that the Father Mother has prepared for you from the beginning of time. And just stop believing your victim selves, your neurotic selves, your self-hating selves. The, the contracted self. The, contracted the closed self. down. In fact, your great Christian um, teacher, yes. Bede Griffith, yes. how did you find him? In oh. fact, you left the guru consciousness. I left the guru consciousness. Actually, I met 
be just before I left the Guru Consciousness. Tell us that story. Andrew. Well, it was a wonderful meeting. It was in 1993, and I left Mary in 90, later that year. I was asked by an Australian film director to go and interview Father Bede Griffiths, who was then 86 and living in South India and had his own ashram and was a Catholic monk who'd opened himself to all different traditions. I went to the ashram. I interviewed him for... <laughs> Um, eight amazing days, and I fell profoundly spiritually in love with him. He changed my life in so many ways, but I think the most important way was that he brought me back to the authentic Christ. Mm. And I realized that the vision of Christ that I'd been given in... Was well, love. Was, uh, love, but also that the Christ is actually the most brilliant and amazing symbol of the sacred marriage we've been talking right. about. The integration. The of integration. The if you were Jungian, you'd say the anima and animus right. of all of us. The masculine and the feminine. Can't, one side can't be disowned, the other can't That's be... It has to be integrated. Isn't this it? is the core revelation. The core revelation is that God is one, but God uses the opposites to yes. create the world, and that by unifying the opposites within oneself, one can awaken to one's complete divine nature and radiate from that unity yes. a new level of power, completion, and energy. Mm -hmm. And this is so important for this time mm -hmm. because. I'm sure you find this. People are terribly dispirited. Oh, yes. People are worn out. People are broken down. What I'm, I'm trying to do afraid. in my work... Uh, terribly afraid. Bring them bring past them fear. past fear to a living experience yes. of divine ecstasy. Which must be experienced. Energy. It really can't be articulated. It's an you amazing thing. You can't articulate thing. it, but the wonderful thing is that we have the great mystical poets Yes, to and you us. love Rumi, Rumi, so that helps me ask you how your path, the story of how it really started yes. in Coimbatore, yes. perhaps, and your yeah. mystical experiences, those three major breaks that you would yes. call those mystical moments, the yes. aha moments, and then how you actually came to, for example, Rumi as a way to explain yes. who you are, where you are, and how you teach. Well, I think I was born in India for a purpose, to unify the West and the East within and, my and consciousness. And say a moment that Coimbatore is near the birthplace of... Well, Coimbatore is one of the places Southern Shiva India. Danced, the great god of South India, the great masculine godhead, danced. And so I feel that I was born into Shiva's country, Shiva's dancing ground. And we and have to explain that these are just aspects of one god. Yes. Not people, don't people think they're, it, it's an idolatry. Right. And it's really Hinduism not. Hinduism has a, at its core a vision of God as the eternal light, one. As the eternal one. That's it. But the, all the different aspects of that one's dance are enshrined yes. in these different gods. Yes. And that's what's so marvelous about Hinduism. And, you know, Jung used these aspects... And, and, of course, people in meditation use these aspects as merging with the characteristics of yes. the aspect that they have to, in a certain way, incorporate. incorporate if or you're get looking rid of, for wisdom, <laughs> if you're looking for the, working on the masculine, you go to Shiva. If right. you want the feminine, go to the and goddess. And these are just images, It's so aspects, wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful because you idea. enter into this dynamic dance, heart copulation, in a way, yes. with the sacred powers. Yes. I was born in India, and then I was put through the English system, because I had to be trained in the English system. Right. But it was an excruciation. I felt as if I was locked in a refrigerator. But you did very well at Oxford. Oh, I overachieved <laughs> like crazy, yes, and I got this fellowship to all yes. sales, and that was wonderful, and I was a professor. But one of the most terrible things that can happen to anybody is that to get exactly what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And I got it at 21, yes. and being a fellow of All Souls was very grand and enabled me to meet the Prime Minister and the heads of business and the major artists and major ballerinas danced on the lawn at midnight. And it was wonderful in one way, but it was also very disheartening because I saw the illusion of the world and I saw just how rotten and corrupt many of the people who rule the world are. And at 21, yes. that is a devastating thing to fear. So I had a series of inner breakdowns mm -hmm. which culminated in a very unhappy love affair, at which moment I realized that I was starving to death in this gilded cage mm -hmm. and then I decided to go back to India at 25 and that opened up a whole integration of the vanished Indian side of myself yes. and I had a series of absolutely shattering mystical experiences at 25 <coughs> when I was living in an ashram by the sea in South India in Pondicherry in Sri Aurobindo's ashram and I was forced to face that my whole education everything I'd ever learned was nothing compared to this new reality that was dawning yes. with me. And 
fundamentally there were three experiences. In the first, I had a dream in which I felt I was in a cloud of voices, and one of the voices said, I am the beloved, and now you must go down. And I went down, and I fell into my body. So I realized that there was this fundamental connection between this the soul and so the This is so Kabbalistic. <laughs> of course, yes, it's the descent in the, descent, the, den, the tikkun olam, of course, the healing. Exactly. The second and, was and of course, that the I had Elohim, the divine feminine. Right. The creator. The, the, mm -hmm. the second vision, I really had a vision of light. Mm -hmm. I was walking back at night by the sea and everything became white light. Mm -hmm. And I heard the whole universe chanting Om and I went back to my hotel room and I was reading the Upanishads and I opened the book and it said, when you are ready, you will hear the entire universe chanting Om and you will see the light of the Divine Presence. And I was yes. petrified yes, because the experience was so vast and it and deranged out everything. Control. Out of control. Right. I, I, I closed the book and concentrated on sort of yes. eating calmly for a few Earth days, getting grounded. grounded. And in the third, which has really been the complete dream of my life, I was on a beach again in India and I saw a figure coming towards me. And this figure was neither male nor female, but both, in white robes, a figure of incredible beauty, so moving and beautiful. And I saw him, her, come towards me and she, he, her, came and lay in my lap. And I was so overwhelmed with love for this figure and I said, who are you? And the figure said to me, I am you. And then I woke up. Oh, okay. And I realized that what I was being shown was the sacred androgyne. That's right. The male-female person right, that I'm trying myself Yes. with all my flaws and faults to come yes. and represent now, yes. the marriage. The marriage. So those three experiences ch changed everything. Yes. And then I went back to try and integrate what I'd learned in India in this Oxford world. And of course it was hopeless because a kind of schizophrenia work. set yes. in. But I was very blessed at that time because I went to Paris and I discovered the translations by a woman called Eva de Vitre Mayerovich in French of Rumi's mystical poetry and at that moment I realized that what I'd seen in India is something that he just knew with every cell of his body. So Rumi became my friend, my guide, my beloved, always saying to me, don't let the rational voices win. There is a great glory here yes. which you have glimpsed and I have truly seen for many years and out of which this great golden torrent of... And I became obsessed with him and I, became, I studied him and I translated him and eventually, actually, I met Ava de Vitre Mayerovich and became really? a great friend of hers. Yes. Because really? I lived in Paris and we met and out of this meeting and out of this obsession with Rumi and out of this experience of his guardianship and his guidance came all the books that I've written about Rumi because yes. Rumi for me is the mystical guide for this yes. great renaissance because whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist, you are a, if you're a lover of God, his vision of God as the beloved and his incredible sense of the beauty and passion of the mystical life will inflame you. So yes. at this moment when we're in such danger, we have the return, of course, of Rumi, the Rumification of oh, the world to give people this inspiration. And this wonderful book that you've written, oh, this you. one of these wonderful books, you've written so many wonderful books, A Walk with Four Spiritual Guides, you yes. speak of. Krishna, yes. Buddha, yes. Buddha as a teacher, in fact, Jesus, and yes. Ramakrishna. Yes. And how the message from all of them yes. is the same. Well, and they, it's the same, but they all have different aspects, aspects. of it. And different ways of, of communicating. Different ways of commu and which we, at this moment, I believe that it's so important to get the inspiration from every side. Yes. I myself don't call myself... And anything. Uh, anything. I'm a mystic independent. <laughs> I revere all the religions, but they've all failed, I think, in the task of unifying humanity. There is a transcendent, imminent mystical revelation, which I know and I'm being born into, and you know. And that's where I like to live. But I also need the inspiration from all of the traditions. Yes. I need Krishna's vision of mystical, mystical activism. I need Jesus' incredible vision of how to incarnate the sacred passion of God. And that it's available to everyone. everyone. Everybody. You get to the Father by me, this map, this interior this. trip. Before we leave, I always ask a, a question that no one's prepared for. I always ask the defining moment in your life. What was your defining moment? The most important thing that ever happened to me in my life happened to me when I was 46 and my father was dying in Coimbatore where I was born and I went back from San Francisco to be with him and I spent this amazing week with him totally beautiful he was a marvelous marvelous man and my heart and his heart merged and I arrived on Tuesday and on the Sunday I went to church 
and the statue of the Christ at the end of the church came alive. So the most defining moment of my life was that for 15 minutes, with open eyes, I saw the resurrected Christ, and from his heart to my heart poured a lava of molten gold and ripped open my entire chest and poured it into my whole being. And since that moment, that energy of passion and love has been within me. And that moment expanded because I went out of the church absolutely full of the glory of the resurrection. And I saw in a puddle a young man without arms and legs. And I heard the voice of the Christ within me saying, you must not play with this revelation because now you must realize that your whole work here is to help end the horrific circumstances that create this misery. Now you must dedicate your whole life to justice and the transformation of the planet and the ending of the horror of the poor. Oh my. And, f and it's interesting, Mother Teresa had a similar experience. And she the was The first moment she lifted yes. the leper, she said, I had to see within that leper the Christ, or I couldn't have gone, and I knew my work could never begin. And that defining moment, I think, it, when you see him or meet him, and she did, and so many yes. people do, because he's helping yes. everybody, you realize that the entire purpose of this mystical journey is not just to wake up yourself, but to use that awakening as it grows to just serve and give everything. Yes. Rumi said, you only take across the waters of death what weighs nothing, and what weighs nothing is love. I love this, Andrew. What a perfect way for us to end the day in a tangible way, the idea of love. That's it. You just, you are it, Andrew. Thank you, darling. And you're a blessing. So are you. Thank you, Andrew. What you see is what you are. Thank you, Andrew. PBS.